okay. If you're a journalist who uses the tool Help a Reporter Out, or Harrow, listen up. Harrow is moving to Cision's new app, Connectively. But what is Connectively? Well, imagine a place where you can quickly connect with expert sources for your next story. Connectively is a new app from Cision that's changing the way journalists like us, content creators, experts and PRs work together. So if you're in search of credible sources, Connectively is your next stop. With just a click, you can publish your queries. These go straight to a feed where experts from loads of different backgrounds can respond, giving you their expertise. So go on, visit connectively.us to sign up for free. That's C-O-N-N-E-C-T-I-V-E-L-Y dot U-S. Connectively dot us. Hello and welcome to Freelancing for Journalists. I'm Lily. And in this series, we're going to be looking at ways of diversifying your income. Yes, hi, I'm Emma. And this is a really exciting series because it talks about all the ways that we can use our skills as freelance journalists to have other income streams. Uh, In this episode, we've got two fantastic guests talking to us about report writing and translation. And they have loads and loads of practical advice for us. I'm really looking forward to that. But this week, before we start, Lily, let's talk about our win of the week. Yes. Okay, shall I start? Yes, please. Go for uh, it. Okay, so I think I mentioned in the last episode or a couple of episodes back that there was a pitch that I um, have been pitching for ages. I knew it was a good story. No one was biting. A bit of a, a bust, you know, no bus has come along and then three turn up situation. So I got a commission that I mentioned last week. Now I've got a second commission for the same story. And I've let them know that I've already got commission elsewhere, but they don't mind about that. So that's good. So I did fess up about that. Um, So yeah, I've got two commissions out of this one story so far that I couldn't get anywhere um, a few weeks ago. So that's my little win. Fantastic. Persistence pays off in the end. Yes, it does. A patience as well, because... They were interested and then went quiet and then came back to me about three weeks later. So, yeah, sometimes it's just, I don't know, it disappears into a black hole and then bubbles up to the surface again. (laughs) Yeah, just bide your time. Yeah. So what's your win, Emma? Yeah, so mine is um, a bit of a side hustle that I've been working on. So I'm vice chair of the Medical Journalists Association and for the past two years this will be the third year we've had an annual symposium which was sort of my baby I, this was an idea that I came up with and so I've sort of been doing it um since the beginning but this is all done in my spare time I don't get paid for this I'm doing this on top of my other work and um, so it's really stressful um and I've just this year um it's in April and I have just confirmed all the speakers for the day and we've got a really, really good lineup. So it's sort of a weight has been lifted because I finally got everybody in place. I've filled the programme. We can start spreading the word and sharing it all. Uh, I also got my sister, who is a designer, to do the poster because my first go at it was absolutely appalling. I just think know when something isn't in your wheelhouse and pass that on to someone else. Um, so yeah, it's just that relief of something coming together in the end yeah well sounds like a lot of hard work but it's yeah very satisfying when it all pays off in the end so well done for getting that all together okay fantastic okay so let's introduce our guests who both have lots of experience in the world of editing and translation Yes, today we have with us Judith Zerdin, who works as a freelance journalist, copywriter and Spanish-French to English translator. Judith says that combining her writing languages and communication skills seemed like a natural career progression. She does translating and proofreading of website copy, and she also translates news script for digital TV channel Arte. And we also have with us Priya Joy, an experienced freelance science journalist and communicator. In addition to her journalism work, Priya has a wealth of experience in writing and editing major global health reports, 
and policy briefs for the World Health Organization, the UN, the Global Vaccine Alliance and MSF. She also runs the substack The Art of Freeland. Fantastic, Bay. Thank you for joining us today. We've got lots to dig into here because um, I feel like you've got so much experience in these areas that our listeners are going to want to hear about. In fact, Judith, when we mentioned uh, translation, we actually had lots of people in the Facebook community saying, oh, I want to know more about this. I want to know about how to get into this. Um, so could you start by telling us a bit about yourself, how you got into journalism and the sort of different types of work you now do as a freelance? Um, yes, so I um, I started off as a as a print journalist um, quite a long time ago. It was um, end of the last century, in fact. Um, I did um, a um, postgraduate diploma in magazine journalism at Cardiff University, um, and that that kind of just set set me off really. Um, and I worked in um, kind of local newspapers um, at the start of my career. Um, fast forward. 17 years of like since of freelancing and kind of moving countries I lived in Colombia for a while um and I decided to um diversify and train as a um a translator because I'd studied languages originally as an undergraduate um so I I did that in 2017 for two years I did it as a part-time uh, I did a master's in translation um, and, and then set myself up as a freelance translator um, as well as a, like a freelance journalist and copywriter. It's interesting that um, you did that, uh, the course, the MA. Is that something, do you think that you do need the extra training in order to get into translating? Yes. Um, so I, it was recommended to me that that was a good way in by a, um, a very good friend of my family who has been a translator for uh, many years. Um, I said to her, you know, if I wanted to go into translation, what's the best way? And she said, you should do a, a qualification and a master's is, is the best thing because it's, it's an academic qualification and translation is quite an academic discipline, really. Um, so, yes, I would I would recommend it. Yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting that. But- you wouldn't necessarily automatically think about it as an academic subject, but actually, yeah, that that does make sense. Um, but Priya, if we come to you, can can you tell us a bit more about again how you got into journalism, but also about the different types of work you do, and again, kind of how do you get into this world of report writing? Yes, so I started out similarly to Judith. I did an MSc um, in science communication. Um, and I, so I'd had a science background already. I studied genetics. I did this master's and, and then I went on to do two internships while I was there. One of them was for Radio 4 and the other one was for The Lancet. And I loved both of them, but there happened to be a job opening at The Lancet. And so I applied for it and I got it. So I kind of went into medical editing, medical writing first. And then while I was there, I started doing, um, like there were parts of the journal that I could write for, like news and opinions, and I was quite a young um, journalist communicator, so I sort of really wanted to get experience in that. So I then started to write for those bits of the journal as well on the side, as well as editing, and I loved it so much. So that was my first foray into kind of journalism as well. And I'd learned feature writing and stuff while I was on my master's, but this was actually putting into practice. So then what I decided is that as much as I loved being in the medical journal world, I wanted to go and work for a new site. Um, So I went on to work for somewhere called Sidebna. And then I was reporting on global health um, and that kind of thing for a few years and then on to New Scientist. And then I sort of came back full circle a little bit where I really missed working for journals because as a journalist, what I was doing is taking... Um, research and then sort of, um, well, and then making it really easy to understand. But I really missed as a former scientist, getting to grips with the science itself and like being kind of much more upstream in terms of publishing. Um, and so, so I, I then started to, I continued journalism. I then went freelance. Um, And then I started trying to write more for places like WHO, the World Health Organization, for example. And that's when the sort of crossover 
happened into report writing and editing and then I ended up doing both for quite a while um and then and then I've kind of carried on doing that more or less for about the last 15 20 years now because I really like the variety I think being um being solely a news journalist can be really hard work you're constantly chasing stories and you're constantly you know having to pitch um report writing solely as well can be quite tough because you're immersed in this project um for quite a while so having the mix of the two i think is a really nice balance of a news piece could be like within the same day or two days and report writing obviously goes on for a lot a lot longer so yeah so that's how i ended up here it's really interesting Priya, because we had a really similar start um to our careers basically i mean pretty much identical you did the science communication course was that the one at imperial that was right yeah. and i did a, a journalism master's after a science degree and then started working at the lancet i was at the lancet oncology and then wanted to do more news and more writing so kind of looked for other um opportunities but i don't know that there's many people who start out in the same that we way that we did so it's interesting to, <laughs> to find a, someone whose yeah. career started in the same I mean, when you decided you wanted to do sort of more of the reports writing side of things, you obviously had those connections through your work on writing about global development. Have you found, how did you find those opportunities? Was it literally through the kind of connections that you already had and people who already knew you? How did you um, sort of find your way into that world, I suppose? I did um, I did two things. One is that I put feelers out to people I knew who worked broadly within organizations. So they would like global health organizations that would commission reports or who would need writers and editors. And then the other thing is I kind of started to brand myself a little bit that way, like in my CV or on my LinkedIn. I don't think there was LinkedIn at the time, but whatever kind of online presence I had, I started to have those in there because... If you're editing, as you know, if you're editing like a really big uh, manuscript for a journal, it can be almost a bit like a short report where you've got a similar risk structure. Um, and so I had all those skills already. I just started to make them a lot more visible. So then I um, tapped into a contact that I had at the World Health Organization and I got like a short report to do. But once I had that and it was done and they didn't have any more work for me, then I went into um, a good old freelance hustle where I would head over to Geneva, try and meet people. Send, I mean, scientists and people who work in science generally are quite approachable, I find. Like everyone likes to talk about their work. And I would just try and meet people for like a coffee and say, um, and then talk to them about the type of work that I did and the kind of breadth of experience that I had. Um, and that's sort of how it then went on. I got a couple more reports and then sometimes I'd be asked to edit. Sometimes I'd be asked to write it from scratch. But yeah, so it sort of built from there. I did get one contact, but then there was a lot of hustling to keep that um, flow of work coming. Yeah, and it's interesting, isn't it, how no matter what kind of discipline you're in, when you're freelancing, it is, isn't it, part of that hustle and making those contacts. I mean, Judith, what was the situation for you? How did you start picking up that translation work? Um, so about halfway through my master's, um, I started just applying for to agencies, um, which is where the majority of my work still comes from. Um, so um, we had a couple of careers fairs at the university um, and representatives from various language agencies translation and interpreting agencies um, came along and you kind of signed up with them and then you had to, you know, send a few more follow-up emails and say, you know, I'm available and stuff. And and I got my first, my first few, my first couple of clients that way um, because that, yeah, that's the best way. I found that that was the best way for me to, to get, to start, to, to, to start getting the work. It's a bit with translation, I mean, with everything really, but with translation particularly, it's a it's a bit of a chicken egg situation that um you you don't have experience, so you 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 contact an agency and they say, well, we want three years experience or something. So it's it's yeah, it's quite hard at the beginning. But there were a couple of agencies that took students on, so I I just started with them, and I, they're still my my main clients now among my main clients. And do you have 
Does it ever then work out that clients might come to you directly once you start working for them, that it leads to sort of more longer term contracts or does it, does it keep going back through those agencies? Um, I haven't really had any contracts as such. Um, yeah, it, it's once, once an, once an agency knows you and the, like you're, you're kind of on their list, your freelance, their freelance list, um, they will, they will contact you, you know, whenever there's work coming in. Um, I have had, um, I've had people contact me. I mean, the Arte job came through LinkedIn. They they were looking for a translator with a journalism background. Um, and with, I don't know any other translators who also have a journalism background. So she contacted me through LinkedIn and asked me if I was interested. And it just kind of went from there. I've been doing that for over a year now. Um, so it's, um, yeah, it, it can be word of mouth as well. I find that um, other translators, once they know you, you if you if you join networks and things, um, they they can put work your way. Um, yeah, yeah, it's that mix, isn't it, of sort of branding yourself, getting yourself known in the right places, um, getting sort of repeat work, and yeah, getting recommendations. Um, yeah. Priya, I mean, have you found that's the same for you when it comes to your branding? Um, because, you, you know, there's lots of sort of strings to your bow. How do you go about sort of selling yourself, I suppose, making sure people know what your skills are? Mm. I mean, now I find probably compared to when I first went freelance, which was a good 20 years ago, because there are so many kind of digital spaces where we can be seen, like lots of people have websites now, at least one or two um, social media channels. I think thinking about that in quite a savvy way, like some people I know might have a website, but then their social media doesn't make it clear who they are. So on mine, what I try and do is um, show a diversity of skills, but still something that kind of pulls it all together. So I really like talking and I like presenting and I like um, training people and kind of things that are quite communal and that involve other people. So I try as much as possible to make that clear on, say, my LinkedIn, for example. Um, and I try and have also personal things as much as I can, as much as is appropriate to sort of show a bit of me, like videos and things like that. Because I think it can be really hard when you're just looking at like a paper CV or an online CV to know what someone is really like, like how they talk, how they come across and all of that kind of stuff. So... Yeah, I mean, I think it's a lot easier to be visible these days. Yeah, and it's really interesting from what you're both saying that Priya, you're, I guess you're more kind of reaching out to people, building those conduct, contacts, whereas Judith, it's more the agency work. Um, so, yeah, it's kind of understanding your field, isn't it, and where those opportunities are. I mean, Judith, I just wanted to come back to you because um, I'm interested, you, you said that, the the job that you're still working on now they wanted um a journalist do you find that there are skills that you have as a journalist in obviously in this job but in other jobs that kind of cross over with with the translation work i'd say the main skill is being able to write well so when i was first thinking about going into translation um the friend who i mentioned and said oh you know as a journalist you'll you'll do really well as a translator because you basically as well as the language skills you 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 basically have to be a good writer you have to be able to write in fluent english good english good english that sounds like um sounds like a native person wrote it from scratch even though it's a translation um you, you know your grammar has to be impeccable your 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 sentence structure everything so i would say that's the main the main skill that overlaps you don't really have them um, the the person the people contact because you're kind of you know on a computer just getting emails and stuff I except when you're networking i suppose that's you know that's obviously where where face-to-face -face, um connections are important but um yeah I, yeah I, I would say i've definitely got an advantage as a as a writer and are the expectations quite clear i suppose about what's expected of you do you get kind of a clear brief when you're doing translation work is there kind of a back and forth process if someone wants something changed how does that do you find that kind of similar or very different to your journalism work no it's pretty different I would say uh, it depends on the client and um, sometimes the so, uh, agencies generally are well can be 
can can give you clear briefs um and then sometimes they don't give you very clear briefs and you have to go back to them and say well you know how do you want how do you want this what you know what do you mean by blah 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 and then they come back to you eventually but um no it, it totally depends on the client as to whether as to how clear it is that what what they're looking for really yeah, it sounds similar to um, copywriting. We, we recorded um, an episode last week about that, we were talking about briefs and, um, yeah, how sometimes it's not always clear. Or the client themselves is not clear themselves what they actually want. Um, so, yeah, it's interesting that that sort of sounds like it also happens in, in translation. Yeah. Um, and Priya, I wonder um, how it works then um with kind of report writing is there a team around you that you're you're working through or or you working sort of individually like directly with the client what what's the setup there so i yeah i generally work directly with a client and in terms of how many any team would usually be on their side so they would probably hire a, a separate freelance designer um someone to do the layout and stuff and then clients are really varied in how they are in their communication. Sometimes there's one point of contact and then it's between me and that person who's commissioned the work and then they go and collate. Usually people have to, you know, run drafts through internal processes and stuff. Sometimes, and I prefer it when it happens that way because then I'm not having to, sometimes I've been in situations where um, there are four or five people, technical people who all need to weigh in. They're all in an email. They've got conflicting comments from each other. <clears throat> and um, and then I'm sort of left in the decision-making um, seat, which I really don't like. And as I've become more experienced, I feel much more comfortable saying, like taking decisions when I can or when I feel able to. But sometimes if it's, for example, like a recommendation at the end of a report, I do put that back on them. And I say, you need to come up, come to a collective decision and then come back to me. Um, so yeah, and then sometimes I do work directly with the designers as well. And that can be really nice because they're both, um, interpreting, I guess, the central messages of the report, but just in slightly different ways. Um, so that is always nice when I can collaborate with a designer, especially on things like graphics, scientific reports often have the graphics and the illustrations can be really central to understanding. Um, the content so that's really enjoyable when I can do it but otherwise it can be a bit of a solitary affair just kind of chugging away through a big report yeah I think you must have a lot more patience than me Priya because if I I'm sometimes I've been in situations where I'm doing a piece of work and it's a really big team and everybody wants to weigh in or have an opinion or feel like and it's just kind of writing by committee and I at that point I sort of lose the will so I'm I'm in awe of anyone who has the, who has the patience to sort of manage that process yeah. but the other thing is it is a really lengthy process so how do you how do you get paid for that is it by project is it by is it sort of a day rate how does that how does that um work so people clients maybe want to do different things I now very firmly work on a day rate so I will estimate a number of days for a project and then I will always allow for extra days because usually when clients create a contract and they've allowed for let's say 10 days if they then want to add days it always becomes a lot more traumatic um, whereas if I've said it could be 10 to 14 days and I will bill you for the number of days that's what I find really works well and really protects me because as a freelancer, like no one is protecting the fact that I need to be paid for my work or I need to be paid for if a project turns into something that it's not, that I am my own advocate. Um, and so, yeah, I very, very rarely agree to a project rate unless the project rate is so far above what I think it's going to take me, even allowing for things to go wrong. Um, then I might do, but it's extremely rare that I take that on. And actually it's better for the client as well, because then they're paying for the time that you've spent on it rather than having agreed to like a huge sum. And then it maybe takes you, you know, a lot less. Yeah. Yeah. And setting those expectations out right at the beginning is, 
is really useful for everyone. So yeah, everyone knows where they stand. And Judith, how does that work in, in translation then? Is is there a set fee for a project or per word? How, how does it work? Yeah, translation is usually paid per word. Um, and it, uh, as to whether it's the, the, the translator or the client who sets that rate, it depends. Usually with an agency, they tell you what they're, they're happy to pay. Even if you, even if they ask you at the beginning, you know, to give us your rates, you know that if you go in too high, they're just going to say, forget it. Or they'll try and, they'll try and kind of, you know, get you to come down. Um, so yeah, so it's per word. Um, with Arte, I get paid per video minute because it's, um, it's a, it's a script. So it, it depends on how long the, the, the videos are. Uh, yeah, we don't, we don't really have project or anything because the translations it's so it can be and it, even if it's even if it's a long project like I last year I was translating a um a kind of a small book well it was I would say a booklet a, a large booklet um from French into English about rivers um it was it was kind of, you know there were chapters it was it, it took me a, a couple of months to do and um, I was still paid per word right so, yeah and how, how does it compare to journalism, the, the rate? Is it similar or higher or lower? Well, it's hard to say because uh, I've never been paid per word in journalism. Um, so it's, it's really hard to say. I mean, generally, generally, I would say that translation isn't that well paid. Um, it could be better paid than journalism because, I mean, I know that some journalism is really badly paid as well. Uh, yeah, so it, it, it's really hard to say. But probably, uh, yeah, it also depends on the time it takes. So it could take like, you know, a, a writing an art, writing a feature could take a week or two weeks or something and you get paid whatever at the end of it, um, 200 pounds or 300 pounds or what, it, but, you know, depending on who you're writing for. Whereas translation, you're, um, it, it, it probably won't take as long, but it might be, it might take, it, it, it won't take as long as many days, but it might take more hours because you have to think. A bit, it's just a different way of thinking. So it, it's hard to, it's just hard to compare really. Yeah. I mean, I think what's clear from both of you is that you're kind of quite clear from the start about expectation, expectations, trying to think about how long something should take, how much work it's going to be. And actually we should all be taking that into account in our journalism work as well. Kind of uh, Lily and I have had these discussions where it might not seem like an article um, that the rate for an article is very high, but actually, you know, you can knock it out in half a day. So it's fine. You're sort of kind of trying to take that into account. And I mean, the other thing that our listeners always want to know about is how people juggle the different parts of their freelance and how they divide up their, um, how they divide up their time, I suppose, and make sure that they're devoting the right amount of time to the right things. Priya, you've got your newsletter as well, The Art of Freelance. And I, so I know this is something that you think about quite a lot about how to make the most of your time. Um, so yeah, how do you how do you divide up and decide what you know how much you're going to spend on what part of it? Yeah, what I've been doing, what I've started doing in the last um, maybe six months or so was re was time blocking. So basically, looking at my week. I might do this on a weekend. I might do it like Monday morning or something. And then just kind of knowing what I have to do that week and allocating chunks of time, uh, um, more or less. Because once I start doing that, so I, w I know by now how much like how much time a 2,000 word feature might take me or how much time a 10 page report might take me to edit. And I allocate chunks of time and I try and mix it so that I'm not doing just report writing, whatever, for days on end as I gets quite tedious and then I become really granular where I put in breaks and I put in like go to the gym and all of this because then I can see my week and although like when sometimes when my husband looks at my color he goes when it looks really stressful like there's things in different colors but to me it's quite soothing because I know okay I'm gonna be able to get most of this report done this week I'm still gonna have breaks and time to do whatever I maybe do my emails in the morning. Um, I usually have a morning call with one of my main clients, Gavi, um, at 9.30. So I know I need to build that in. And it really just kind of 
A allows me to see how, what, where I'm spending my time, how much time I'm allocating, because I think we've all had this um, situation where we think something's going to take us a few days and it ends up taking us so much longer, or we're not even aware of how, how long something's taken us. And so then your fee is effectively, if it's like a set fee, is getting sh it's shrinking by the every hour and every day that you spend on it. You know, that's over what you thought. So I kind of like map out my week that way. Uh, I try not to go more than a week or two in advance um, because otherwise it will just start to get feel like I'm, I don't know, some crazy CEO who's going from meeting to meeting. But it, yeah, I find it really helps and it actually makes me much more conscious of how much time I'm spending on something. And then I can actually, if it's if it's a project that's lasted a month, I can then look back and say with confidence to a client that, oh, it's taken me this much time. I know some people who use their various apps, um, can't remember what they're called now, but there are apps where you can log, you know, when you start a thing and, and log off or whatever. That's a bit, a bit too granular for me, but yeah, mapping out my agenda, my kind of diary really helps at the start of the week. Yeah, that's really interesting. I would like to be more like that to kind of, yeah, to be able to visualize it. But I just find that my work is so flexible and that I'm always doing different things or something else is coming up or I want to fit in something personally or something's happening with the kids that I worry that if I had those blocks of time and then I was breaking them or moving them all the time that I, I'd, I'd feel like I was failing in some way but I do like the idea of logging like how much time you're spending on stuff although I think that probably works better for longer term projects maybe um, maybe it's not possible if you're sort of churning out a lot of copy a week um, and just as an aside we did do a episode on time management um, in a previous series that I'll put a link to um, which we talked about some of those apps because um, Anna Harding uses a lot of um, apps for all of her organization and she's one of those like granular uh, people that seems to be on top of it all um, I'm much more pen and paper. Judith, how about you? How do you kind of organise your week and all the different things you do? Well, I'm a bit a bit similar to you because um, my work is very flexible. I don't really have a plan. Um, I I don't block out time because also I just, from week one week to the next, I rarely know what's going to come in that week. So I could have a day of, you know, where nothing comes in and then I'm just kind of trying to do some CPD or... Um, I'm doing an online copywriting course at the moment to just kind of hone my skills there. So I do that, you know, a bit of the time if I've got some, if I've got a couple, spare couple of hours. Um, and translations can just come into my inbox anytime during the day. And I'll just, if, you know, if I've got the time and I'm, and I, and I, and I know that I'm going to be able to do it before picking the kids up from school or whatever, and I don't have to work in the evenings, then I'll say yes. Or I might negotiate deadline and they, they, it is quite flexible can be flexible you can negotiate deadlines and say actually I can't do it today would you would 11 o'clock tomorrow morning be okay and then um and and journalism is just kind of it, it's my own time anyway I don't have anyone asking me to do stuff really I mean copywriting I do uh when that comes in but yeah journalism is just it was also something I, I kind of just do when you know when when I've got the time when when I'm not doing the translation so it's it's very yeah it's flexible yeah. Yeah. I think I land, I was nodding a lot when Lily was speaking because I think I land somewhere between both of you. And I am trying really hard to block out bigger chunks of, of time for things, especially when you've got those longer term projects that, because a lot of my journalism is kind of a news story here or a little feature here and, and I'm juggling lots of things. And so you can, you can go in and out, out of it. And I'm so easily distracted. Like every time an email comes in, I will answer it immediately. And but I am finding I am having to do that, right, this afternoon is only going to be for this and I'm turning everything off so that I can concentrate on this in order to do a good job. So I'm a work in progress, but we're, we're trying to find the the right balance of those two things. Um, I think our final question um, for both of you really is on your separate areas is what advice you would have for someone who's looking to get into this type of work, your sort of top tip. So... Here, I'll come to you first. If someone is looking into getting into kind of report writing, editing, kind of this more formal uh, uh, kind of projects, 
Um, what would your sort of key bit of advice to them be? So I would say if this is a journalist going into trying to get into report writing and editing, I would put together a, a few clips or, or a few, like a little portfolio of my longer form pieces because the more long form a piece of journalism, the more closely it resembles a report. Um, and then I would reach out to like the communications teams, usually in big organisations from whatever field um, you're trying to get into or that you're already working. I think aiming for those comms teams, because even if they're not the ones who would be commissioning reports, they usually know if it's like a big organisation with different departments, they will usually know people who do and they can put you in touch. So I, yeah, I think just getting together a nice little portfolio of things that resemble report writing, even if you've ne never done it before, a cover letter explaining why you'd be really good at it and then just like contacting kind of a massive blast of like loads of comms people um, would be probably a really good first way to get into it. Yes, because there's all sorts of organisations, charities, groups who would potentially use those skills. So it's just about finding those that are in the field that you're interested in or write about most often. Um, and Judith, when it comes to translation, have you got a sort of one bit of advice for someone who's thinking, you know, maybe they are bilingual, you know, they've got strong language skills, but they're just not sure about taking that next step. Um, what would your sort of key tip be? Well, my key tip would also be to take a, um, to do a qualification in it, not necessarily a master's because there are diplomas and things you can do as well. Um, the Institute of Translation and Interpreting, the ITI, is um, like the industry, well, the industry body um, for, for translation and interpreting. They have a lot of resources on their website um, and suggestions and things. And they, they list all the universities that um, have like translation courses. Um, that's, that's, that's the best way. And I, I find uh, because then people, once you've got that qualification under your belt, um, agencies and uh, potential clients are going to be hopefully more more likely to um, give us work. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, that's been so helpful and lots of practical advice there. Actually, um, at the end to to wrap up, which is great. And I'll um, I'll dig out a link to that um, interpretation body that you just mentioned and put that in the show notes. Um, but thank you both so much. And um, before we kind of uh, sign off completely though we want to come to you to get a recommendation of a piece of work by another freelancer to uh, share the freelance love as it were so Priya what's your recommendation my recommendation is a piece in the Guardian by my friend Linda Geddes so she's another science writer that I used to work with on New Scientist and she just has a brilliant way of writing and this is a piece about lab grown meat so lab grown meat that we might eat and so people are really taking this to a next level where they're almost making this gourmet so i would highly recommend she's it's got something like she goes through like a six course imagined menu of things like foie gras and all of this kind of stuff but all grown in a petri dish as a vegetarian <laughs> <laughs> and, um, doesn't exactly appeal to me but it does sound interesting um so i'll go and find that and uh, yeah, we'll add that to the to the show notes. And Judith, what's your recommendation? Um, well, I I follow a um a, a lady called Ariane Shireen, who is a comedy writer um and comedian. She has she's been published in the Guardian and lots of other places, and um, and she's got a a blog um on Substack um and she. She wrote recently, I mean, she writes really funny. I really like her blogs because they're just really funny and she's very self-deprecating, um, but just really clever as well. And she wrote one recently um, about, oh, why why I legally changed my name five times and it's just about how, she, how she's had so many different identities and passports and it, she kind of delves into her background. And the reason why, it's just really interesting. It's quite, um, yeah, off topic and I don't know, just, I just find her really funny. That's great. I love those pieces that are just uh, kind of really random or just, yeah, looking at something from a completely different uh, perspective and making you smile. That's always that's always my thing, isn't it? So we'll add all of those links so that you can, uh, everyone can go and look at these fantastic recommendations. 
That's it for this episode. Uh, if you want bonus podcast episodes, you can become a premium newsletter subscriber where you get access um, to an extra weekly newsletter and all kinds of resources. Um, you can find everything else on our website at freelancingforjournalists.com. And also, um, big thanks to our producer, Maddie Drury. Yep, and we'll be back again next week. But until then, goodbye. Bye.